Recall that we can graph a line which is in standard form fairly easily. And the standard form of a line looks like ax plus by equals c, where a, b, and c are real numbers, x and y are variables, and we've seen how when we graph this, uh, when we graph this linear equation, or graph the solutions to it, to be precise, we get a line in the rectangular coordinate plane. What we haven't looked at is what happens when one of a or b is zero. In all the examples that we've seen up until now, both x and y appeared in our equation. But sometimes it's the case that you're working with a linear equation and one of the variables just disappears, just cancels out. Or maybe it wasn't even there to begin with. And you can get equations of the form x equals some number, x equals 5, or y equals negative 3, uh, things like this. And so we want to look at what, how we graph the solutions to these equations. Let's start with this first one, x equals 5. So let's think about how do we uh, graph this. Or in other words, what do solutions to this equation look like? Now, we have to n have the context in our problem that we're thinking of this equation as an equation in two variables whose solutions are pairs of points. That's not obvious just looking at the equation, of course, because only x shows up. But we might still look at this and ask uh, for us ask for the solutions. Graph the solutions to the equation x equals five on the uh, rectangular coordinate plane. And we can still ask whether a pair of numbers gives a solution to the equation x equals 5 or not. So let's ask that. Let's ask, is the pair, let's say, 3 comma 4 a solution? Well, remember that the way we check whether a point is a solution or not, or whether a pair is a solution or not, is we plug in the values. We plug in the first coordinate for x and the second coordinate for y and see whether we get a true statement. We can still do that, even though there's no place to put the y in. That means that the y coordinate over here just isn't going to be used. We're going to take this x and plug it into the equation x equals 5. And so we say, does 3 equal 5? Uh, this is false. 3 does not equal 5. And so that means that the point 3, 4 is not a solution. Well, once we do that, then we can see pretty easily that the only points that are going to be solutions to this equation are the points that have an x-coordinate of 5. So we can ask, or we can check our work here, check our thought process, and we can just take some random point with an x-coordinate of 5 and ask, is 5 comma 1 a solution? Well, let's plug it in. We'll plug the x value of 5 into our equation x equals 5 and get 5 equals 5, and this is true. Now, this 1 didn't, didn't matter here. So 5 comma 1 is a solution, but 5 comma 2 is going to be a solution. 5 comma 3 is going to be a solution. And in fact, any point 5 comma uh, blank, 5 comma b, is a solution to x equals 5. 
So that, that looks kind of like a six. I want this B to really be just any, any number at all. So any point five comma B is a solution to X equals five, because if we plug five in for X, we get a true statement. And then similarly, if we take any point whose X coordinate is not five, then that point won't be a solution to the equation x equals 5. So let's graph out these points. So let's graph the solution set to x equals 5. some points here, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3. All right, so we saw some solutions uh, on the previous page. We saw that the point 5, 1 is a solution, which sits right there. We saw that 5, 2 is a solution. We saw that the point 5, 3 is a solution, and in fact, as we said, if we take the point 5, comma anything, any number at all, we will get a solution to this equation. Now what that means is that the graph of this equation is a vertical line. So this is something that we haven't seen yet. We have a line that's just straight up and down, just straight vertical. But this is, in fact, the correct solution set. So uh, our fact that we can use whenever we run into an equation like this is that the graph of the equation x equals c, where c is a real number, is a vertical line passing through the point, well, c comma zero. We could really pick any of these points that it passes through, but in particular, we know that the equation x equals five is going to be the vertical line that passes through the point five zero. So this is the solution set to x equals 5. And once we know this, we can graph all sorts of equations like this. The equation x equals 1 will have a solution set that looks like this. It's going to be a vertical line passing through the point 1. The equation uh, x equals negative 3 will be a vertical line that passes through the coordinate, negative, the x coordinate negative three. So one way of intuitively understanding what's going on here with vertical lines is that when I write down an equation like x equals five, then that means that I'm only looking for points with an x coordinate of five. In other words, I'm only looking for points that lie exactly above or below the number 5 on the horizontal axis because that's what determines the x-coordinate of my points. And so that's why the solution set looks like the vertical line of all points that sit above or below, directly above or below the coordinate 5 on the x-axis. So this works whenever you run into uh, the equation x equals some number. You can always graph it uh, as a vertical line. That is the graph of the equation in that, in that case. So as you might imagine, the situation works kind of similarly for equations of the form y equals a number. Let's work through the reasoning a little bit, but now that we understand what's happen what happens with x equals some number, we'll be able to 
uh, understand the Y case pretty easily. So let's consider the graph of y equals negative 3. So again, we can start writing down solutions to this equation. And the solutions are going to be a bunch of points, but the y-coordinates of those points have to be negative 3. Because if the y-coordinates aren't negative 3, then they won't make this equation true when you plug them in. And as long as the y-coordinate is negative 3, we will be able to plug them in. Now again, the x variable doesn't show up in this equation, which means that we can let the x value of these points be anything we want. So I could go 1, 2, negative 4, 5, and 0. So all of these are sum of the solutions to this equation. Let's graph those out and we'll see something that, whoops, uh, that is not too surprising. So we've got our x and y axis. Got negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. Four, and let's graph out some of these points. So the point 1 comma negative 3 is right there. Point 2 comma negative 3 is right there. The point negative 4 comma negative 3 is over here. Point 5 comma negative 3 is going to be over here. And the point 0 comma negative 3 is right there. Thus, our solution set is, in fact, a horizontal line. And if the horizontal line consisting of all points in the plane whose y coordinate is negative 3, it's all the points that lie directly to the left or directly to the right of the coordinate negative 3 on the y axis. So, Here's our solution set, and, and that's uh, really all there is to it. This is y equals negative 3. We could graph out some others like we did before. If I want to graph y equals 4, then I go up here to, to the y-coordinate of 4. And here's the graph of y equals 4. If I wanted to graph y equals 0, that would consist of all points that lie on the x-axis. So in fact, the x-axis is the same as the solution set to the equation y equals 0. Because this is all the points on the plane that have a y-coordinate of 0. So again, we can write this down very, um, very precisely. As a fact, the graph of y equals c, where c is a real number, is a horizontal line passing through the point 0 comma c. So it's the set of all points that have a y coordinate of c, whatever that, whatever that real number c is. And so these are how we describe vertical and horizontal lines. Whenever an equation simplifies down to a point where there's only one variable left, you're going to get either a vertical or a horizontal line. If it doesn't, if you always have, if you have an x and a y in your equation, even after simplifying it down as far as possible, you're not going to get a vertical or horizontal line. It's going to be sloped one way or the other. Uh, and so, this is 
how we describe vertical and horizontal lines. They are, uh, they are quite easy to describe. They have very simple equations, just x equals a number for vertical lines or y equals some number for horizontal lines. So that's how we handle horizontal and vertical lines, uh, graphing them. So let's look at a couple of other things that we want to look at now that we understand describing points in space and giving coordinates, numerical, uh, numerical values to points. This process, this um, method of doing essentially geometry while using algebra was actually quite a huge uh, revolution of mathematics. Uh, and we can owe much of that to, uh, to a French mathematician and philosopher named René Descartes, uh, the uh, person who's most famous probably for saying cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. Uh, he was a philosopher, but also quite a good mathematician. And this is why sometimes the rectangular coordinate plane is also sometimes called the Cartesian plane after René Descartes. And what connecting po uh, points in space with numbers via coordinates does for us is it, is it allows us to use algebra to to describe these things and to uh, solve problems. In particular, what I want to look at now is how we might compute the distance between two points if we know their coordinates. So let me take an, as an example these two points. Um, so here I'm using the tick marks as uh, uh, or rather, I'm using the squares on the grid as uh, one unit wide in each case. And so this point in quadrant 2 has coordinates negative 2, comma 2. And the point in quadrant 1 has coordinates 3, comma 4. And let's suppose that I want to know what the distance is between these two points. This can be quite relevant for many types of situations. For instance, we could be using a grid system in order to describe positions on, say, a field. And we're marking points on a field for, um, for whatever purpose we want, and we want to know how far it is from this marker here, which we've given coordinates of negative 2, comma 2, 2, and this other one over here, which has coordinates that we look at. If it's a short enough distance, we could just take a tape measure, but if these distances are very, very long, if these are being measured in, say, miles, then uh, we don't want to have to go through this, uh, that process. We would rather use algebra. And so the question is, how would we figure out this distance? Well, here's where we can go back to some geometry again. One of the most famous theorems in all of mathematics uh, possibly the most famous, is the Pythagorean Theorem. Which I will abbreviate here. It says that if we have a right triangle with side lengths A, B, and the hypotenuse has length C, this means that A squared plus B squared equals c squared. If you square the lengths of the two legs of a right triangle, that number is equal to the square of the hypotenuse. It's incredibly important as a theorem in many branches of mathematics, including this one here. Now, at first, you may wonder at that because it doesn't look like we have a triangle involved. But because we have this rectangular coordinate system we're working with, in some sense, we have horizontal and vertical lines running all over the place, like we just saw. Horizontal and vertical lines uh, come about very naturally when working with the coordinate system. And in particular, we could look at the following. We could try looking at this triangle. Let's examine this triangle. 
we've got a right angle here where the horizontal line and the vertical line we've constructed meet. Let's ask what the coordinates are of this, um, of this point. This point has the y coordinate of our left point and the x coordinate of our right point. So it has coordinates 3, 2, because it sits above 3 on the x axis and to the right of 2 on the y axis. From here, we can figure out the lengths of each of these, um, of each of these sides. Now the vertical side, notice, goes from a height of 2 to a height of 4. And that's going to be a distance of 2. Whereas the bottom goes from a, an x-coordinate of negative 2 all the way up to an x-coordinate of 3. That's a difference of 5. So what that means is that if we want to know the distance between these two points, we can use this triangle and the Pythagorean theorem. So the Pythagorean theorem will tell us that c squared is equal to 5 squared plus 2 squared. 5 squared is 25, 2 squared is 4, so we get 29. So we have that c squared is equal to 29, so c is equal to plus or minus the square root of 29. Now, we don't actually use both of these here because negative distances don't make sense. So, in fact, we can just say that c equals, I'm sorry, I don't know where that came from, c equals the square root of 29, since negative distance is meaningless. So we can say that the distance between the point negative 2, 2 and the point 3, 4 is the square root of 29. If you needed this for an application, you would likely plug this into a calculator, get an approximation, but for us, we will leave it in its exact form, square root of 29. So let's see how we might do this in more generality. We don't want to necessarily have to go through this whole process of sketching the triangle every single time we want to do things. What we would like to get is a formula, and fortunately, we can. Let's see how. So I'm going to do a uh, very similar graph, except this time I'm not going to uh, specify uh, what the coordinates of these points are. I'm going to leave things pretty abstract. In particular, I'm going to call one of my coordinates x, uh, one of my points to have coordinates of x1, comma y1, and the other one to have uh, to have points or have have coordinates x2 comma y2 and again we want to know this distance well we can follow the same process of uh, trying to construct a triangle and the Pythagorean theorem will still hold to find C as long as we can describe what the lengths of these two, uh, length, uh, the lengths of these two sides are. So, uh, what we're going to do, rather than explicitly identify the coordinates of the corner, is we're going to understand these horizontal and vertical parts as being sort of components of the movement from the first point to the second one. We could think of traveling from uh, the first point, x1, y1, to the second point, x2, y2, by traveling horizontally for a while and then traveling vertically. So if we do that, we could say, all right, well, how far would we have to travel vertically? 
I'm sorry, horizontally. And this is going to be given by the difference between the x-coordinates of these two points. So the x-coordinate of the first point is x1, the x-coordinate of the second point is x2. And the distance between those two is going to be given by the difference between the coordinates. So the distance from x1 to x2 is exactly the difference x2 minus x1. Similarly, we can look at what happens when we move from uh, move vertically from the level of the first point to the level of the second as we move from y1 to y2. That distance that we have to travel is y2 minus y1. And so we are almost there, but I do want to step back and mention that we do need to be a little bit careful. Now, if we want to develop a general formula for the distance between any two points, we would rather not have to specify anything about those. We, sh we want a function that just takes as inputs two points, x1, y1, x2, y2, any two points, and gives the distance between them. So in particular, that means that we want the same formula to apply even if the points don't happen to be in the configuration that we've got now. So in particular, we might have points, I might have an x1, y1, and an x2, y2, where x2 minus x1 is negative. Maybe the first point is to the right of the other one, or maybe the first point is above the other one. Maybe some of these diff differences are negative. And negative lengths don't make sense as sides of triangles. So properly speaking, what we should do is we should put the absolute value around each one of these. So the length of the bottom side here is the absolute value of x2 minus x1, and the length of the vertical side is the absolute value of y2 minus y1. And this will hold true even if you take these points and put them in uh, any other configuration, because now the absolute value of x2 minus x1 is literally just the distance between those two points on the number line. And similarly for the absolute value of y2 minus y1. So now we're, uh, we're ready to go. So now by Pythagoras, we have that c squared is equal to the absolute value of x2 minus x1 squared plus the absolute value of y2 minus y1 squared. So that means that c is equal to the square root of the absolute value of x2 minus x1 squared plus the absolute value of y2 minus y1 squared. Now, uh, normally, we would need a plus or minus here, but we know that c is a distance, and therefore it's always positive. So this gives us a formula for the distance between these two points. Now, I just spent a couple of minutes talking about why we ought to be careful about labeling these sides with absolute values. The bad news is that if we had been, we could have been lazier and sloppier and still gotten to the right answer. Um, the good news is we've thought through it properly and our formula doesn't actually need the absolute values. We can in fact write this as x2 minus x1 just in parentheses squared plus y2 minus y1 in parentheses squared. And let's see why that is. And the reason for that is because um, for, any, uh, for any number x, uh, the absolute value of x squared is equal to x squared. 
And if you take the absolute value of some number and square it, that gives you the same thing as if you just took the number itself and squared it. And basically this is since uh, x squared is always greater than or equal to zero for any real number x. So um, we, we don't actually need to include the absolute values in our formula, but it was important for us to to be careful about that as we were going through. However, now that we've got it, we have this formula, which I'll write down formally uh, on the next page as our distance formula. So, another fact, the distance between uh, x1, y1, and x2, y2 is uh, the absolute value of x2 minus x1 squared plus the, uh, I'm sorry, the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Uh, and we often write this uh, as the distance function. distance function where we say d of the point x1 y1 comma x2 y2 is this expression. So uh, this, uh, this distance function here it's a function that takes as input two points and gives as output a number. So let's see some examples. Let's find the distance between uh, 1 comma 0 and negative 2 comma 7. So uh, what we uh, what we want to do is identify one of these points as x1, y1, and one of them as x2, y2. It actually doesn't matter which one you choose. Um, if you switch the order, if you choose 1, 0 to be your x2, y2, and your negative 2, 7 to be your x1, y1, you're going to get exactly the same number out. And that's because the distance from one point, from point A to point B is the same as the distance from point B to point A. So, the solution to this, we plug them into the distance formula. The distance between the point 1, 0 and the point negative 2, 7 is the square root of x2, which is negative 2, minus x1, which is 1, squared. Make sure that you're always taking the difference of the x's and that you're taking the difference of the y's. Uh, sorry, 7 minus 0 squared. So x2 minus x1 plus y2 minus y1. All right, a little hint. Within each set of parentheses where you're squaring things, it actually doesn't matter what order you do them in. You just need to take the difference of the x's and square it, and then the difference of the y's and square it. It doesn't really matter what order you do them in there. What you do have to make sure of is that you're not subtracting x's from y's or y's from x's. You can't ever mix x's and y's together, but as long as you keep them together and you're subtracting them, the squared will basically take care of any switching around that you do. Uh, however, make very sure that you're actually using a plus in between. A common error when starting using the distance formula is putting minuses everywhere. Notice that there are minuses inside the parentheses, but there's a plus connecting the two squared expressions. So the distance between these two points is given this way, simplifying things down, negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3, so we get negative 3 squared. 7 minus 0 is 7, we get 7 squared, so we get the square root of 9 plus 49, which is the square root of 58 
Uh, now, whenever you get a square root like this, which you do when you're working with distance functions, you always want to make sure that you simplify this as far as possible. Uh, so remember that a good way of simplifying radical uh, numbers is to factor them as far as possible. Now, 58 happens to factor as 2 times 29, um, and so we can see that there are no pairs of factors. If we had gotten a pair of factors, like two twos in our uh, factorization here, that would have allowed us to factor some things out of the square root, but, we, but in this case, we don't have anything like that. Uh, or another way of thinking about it is that we simplify radical uh, square roots rather by finding perfect square factors of the numbers inside. Uh, check the um, uh, check chapter zero of the book or the the introduction to the book um, if you need a review on uh, simplifying radical uh, expressions like this. All right, last topic uh, for today is the midpoint of two points. So again, we've got a way of expressing geometry in, uh, and using algebra on it. So we want to take as much advantage of that as we can. So the next thing that we want to look at is taking a couple of points and finding the midpoint of the segment between them. So let's take the point 2 comma 1 and let's take the point 3 4 5 6 comma 4 and let's look at the segment connecting them and we want to ask what's the midpoint of this segment. So uh, we know from geometry that every segment has a midpoint and so it's going to be somewhere in uh, in here and we want to know what the coordinates of that midpoint are. So again we can get at this a similar way to how we did uh, the distance formula. We're not going to construct a triangle or anything like that, but what we can do is we can look at what's happening on the level of the x-coordinates and then what's happening on the level of the y-coordinates. Because if we can figure out what the x and the y-coordinate of the midpoint are, then we're done. That's what we're trying to find. So what we can look at is taking this, taking this segment uh, and the midpoint of it, if we sort of just drop everything down or lift everything up straight to the x-axis, then we're going to have uh, the two sides go down to 2 and 6 respectively. And then this point is going to go down here. And because it's the midpoint of this segment, it's going to go down to the point halfway in between. So this is the halfway point between 2 and 6. Or another way of saying this is this is the average of 2 and 6, which we can get by taking 2 plus 6 and dividing by 2, which gives us 8 over 2, which is 4. So when we drop, when we take the midpoint and drop it down to the x-axis or lift it up to the x-axis, we are going to get a point that's exactly halfway between the x-coordinates of the two points on either, on either side of the segment. So this point is going to have a uh, first coordinate of 4. Let's do the same thing for the y's. If we look at what happens to the uh, to the two endpoints of the segment, they're going to go to one and four, and the midpoint is going to go to the 
halfway point between them. So this is going to go to the average of 1 and 4, which is going to be 1 plus 4 over 2, which is 5 halves. So that means that our midpoint is going to be the point 4 comma 5 halves. So this little analysis here allows us to get a midpoint formula. And the midpoint formula says that the midpoint of the segment from the point x1, y1 to the point x2, y2 is the midpoint, or is the point given by x1 plus x2 over 2, y1 plus y2 over 2. One intuitive, very, very fuzzy, but intuitive way of thinking about this is that if I've got two points, then the midpoint of the segment connecting them is in some ways the average of those two points. Again, this can be made precise, but uh, this is the intuition. If I've got two points, their average, if their average makes any sense at all, would have to be the midpoint between them. And so that means that the coordinates of the midpoint is going to be the average of the coordinates of the two, uh, of the two points of the endpoints of the segment. So uh, that's some intuition that can help you to, to remember uh, how the midpoint formula works. So the midpoint of a segment is given by just taking the averages of the x-coordinates and the averages of the y-coordinates, or the average each of those. So one example, let's find the midpoint of the segment uh, connecting the points uh, 3 comma negative 2 and uh, 6 comma 4. So we could sketch this out. Uh, notice we don't need to with this formula, but we could. Uh, let's say we had, uh, let me count up by twos here. Two, four, six, two, four, negative two, negative four. So the two points I'm looking at are three comma negative two, which is about there and 6 comma 4 which is about there. So I'm looking at this segment right here and trying to uh, trying to find the midpoint. Well to find the midpoint I don't actually need to graph it out at all I just need to use the formula and so the x-coordinate of the midpoint is the average of the x-coordinates of the endpoints and the y-coordinates of the midpoint are the averages of the y-coordinates of the endpoints. So we get 3 plus 6 over 2, comma, negative 2 plus 4 over 2. So we get uh, 9 over 2, comma, uh, 2 over 2. So we get 9 halves, comma, 1. So it's going to be oh, somewhere right there about 9 halves comma 1. But if the problem is just asking you for the midpoint, then uh, you just need uh, you just need that right there. So uh, that's how we find the midpoint. Um, the Cartesian geometry, also known as analytic geometry, is incredibly help, uh, helpful and incredibly powerful. And since it was introduced by Descartes, has been a central topic of mathematical study uh, everywhere. And uh, we owe quite a lot to his formulation of connecting geometry and algebra.